Okay, uh, now we'll begin the lunchtime briefing. Welcome everyone. My name is Suya Niu and I'm co-director at Korea Future. I'd like to welcome our audience and our speakers to today's event, which is titled Barriers to North Korean Women's Leadership and Participation in the Human Rights Movement. Korea Future is an independent, non-profit, non-governmental organization whose mission is to investigate human rights violations in North Korea, to support accountability for perpetrators, and accelerate justice for victims. To further combat injustice, we build the capacities of rights holders in the diaspora, particularly women. This event marks the culmination of a 12-month project, which has been generously funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. Today, we're also launching a report from that project, which is available for download from our website. And we'll also put a link in the chat box below. Our project, which was led by my colleague, Kyung Min Shin, who is also one of our speakers today, drew on the experiences of 178 exiled North Korean women in South Korea to highlight the barriers that were preventing their full participation and leadership in the North Korean human rights movement. Our report, which frames today's event, draws attention to the unique challenges facing exiled women who wish to enter and succeed in civil society organizations. It presents information on the structural barriers of identity-based and gender-based discrimination that can dampen the aspirations and the abilities of exiled women. And it describes indirect forms of discrimination resulting from lack of access to employment and unfair treatment that create hidden barriers and glass ceilings. While our report defines the challenges of addressing these deeply entrenched barriers, it also points to some low hanging fruits for civil society organizations, grant makers and also charitable entities to actively engage and incorporate more exiled women in civil society organizations focused on North Korea. Women across the world face barriers that prevent their full participation and leadership in civil society. Ultimately, we hope our research can provide a platform for developing practical actions to increase exiled women's involvement in the North Korean human rights movement and in turn, grow collective action to address the ongoing commission of mass human rights violations in North Korea. Without further ado, I'm pleased to present our lunchtime panel to, to discuss women's leadership and participation in the human rights movement. We'll hear from Kyung Min Shin, who will walk us through some of the key findings from the project and draw our attention to the unique challenges facing exiled women who wish to enter and succeed in civil society organizations focused on North Korea. Kyung Min is a project lead at Korea Future and will soon begin the second phase of this project. Kyung Min, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Suyan, for um, the introduction. It's my pleasure to speak uh, to uh, speak about this important issue today. As Suyan mentioned, over the past twelve months, I have led a project that has examined why exiled North Korean women are underrepresented in civil society organizations or CSOs working on North Korean human rights. It goes without saying that women across the world still face barriers that prevent their full participation and leadership in many sectors, including civil society. But the question we were grappling with was, what issues make the situation of exiled North Korean women so unique? Women account for 72% of the North Korean diaspora, but men occupy over 68% of the leadership roles and display a higher participation rate in CSOs focused on North Korea than women. Our evidence does not suggest that men consciously act as gatekeepers in North Korea focused civil society. Many exiled men also um, are subject to different barriers um, that can prevent their path into S um, CSOs. What our evidence showed was that the barriers facing exiled women defy explanations as one singular um, problem and solution. Another question that underscored our project and one that we asked ourselves was, what if there was a gender balance in the North Korean human rights field? We ourselves have seen the consequences of gender imbalances in other areas of human rights field, especially in the development of digital tools. And we can assume there are consequences for our organizations when few women participate and lead. 
For the North Korean human rights movement to thrive, we believe that gender equality must become a binding norm and a lived reality. Um, let me pull out some data for you to see. Um, I'll begin with some headline findings about the barriers uh, that were revealed through our work with the diaspora. Our findings can be split into four categories, um, identity-based discrimination, gender-based discrimination, unequal opportunities for employment, and a perceived inadequacy in professional training and experiences. However, it is important to say that all of these forms of discrimination were overlapping, uh, meaning that an intersectional approach to devising solutions to these challenges will be critical. First, um, we found that identity-based discrimination plays a big role in how North Korean women perceive themselves in society, and that this has a big an impact on their perceptions of the human rights field and their desire or lack of desire to become um, involved. Exiled North Koreans who have settled in South Korea face unique forms of identity-based discrimination that are based on historical prejudices about North Korea as dangerous and North Korean exile as disloyal, idle, unthankful, or ill-mannered. Um, our survey established um, that 43% of respondents had experienced at least one form of identity-based discrimination since arriving in South Korea. And 18% of respondents stated that fears of identity-based discrimination in South Korean society meant they would not consider employment in CSOs working on North Korea. One respondent stated that she had not even revealed her own identity, her own North Korean identity to her children, fearing they would suffer discrimination in, at their local elementary school. Identity-based discrimination affects not only how exiles view CSOs focused on North Korea, it also influences their willingness to discuss human rights issues. Among respondents, 22% had chosen not to discuss or read about North Korean human rights um, since settling in South Korea, and 52% have never attended any North Korean-focused human rights activities or events since settling in South Korea. The reluctance of respondents to engage with North Korean human rights issues is all the more significant when we consider that 56% had been settled in South Korea for between three to 10 years and 19% for over 10 years. This suggests the barriers caused by identity-based discrimination are lasting. As I've mentioned, women account for 72% of the North Korean diaspora in South Korea meaning that their identities and experiences represent the majority experience among the exiled community. Despite this, respondents believe their identities, experiences of human rights violations, and opinions on human rights interventions were not well represented in civil society, and this discouraged women from seeking employment in these organizations. Only 52% of the respondents were open to opportunities to become involved in, North, in the North Korean human rights movement as it exists today. Our second finding was that gender-based discrimination intersects with identity-based discrimination to strengthen existing barriers to ex um, exiled women's participation in CSOs. Discriminatory cultural norms in South Korea that marginalize women from leadership roles are also present in the North Korean diaspora. Over the quarter of uh, respondents attributed the limited participation of exiled women in civil society to the diaspora's normative preference for women to be passive. Cultural norms in both South Korean society and the diaspora concerning family and parental duties were found to be big disablers for women seeking to enter civil society. Among respondents, 68% felt pressured by gender norms to give up employment and assume family and childcare duties, and nearly 30% were spending between 22 and over 35 hours per week on unpaid domestic labor for their families. This is markedly higher than the average for um, employed South Korean women who spend 2.5 hours per day on unpaid domestic labor. Those, um, these norms have led to noticeable consequences. Significantly, 31% of respondents did not identify gender equality within the workplace as a priority, and nearly 90% of respondents were unaware of women leaders in CSO focused on North Korea. 
One respondent even stated that she could not hope to become a leader because she believed the role to be entirely inaccessible. Our next finding was that while direct discrimination based on identity and gender creates barriers for women, the consequences of indirect discrimination by which I mean the hidden barriers to gender equality are just as critical in preventing exiled women from entering CSOs on North Korea. Um, a significant number of exiled North Korean women who have settled in South Korea are unemployed. South Korea's national unemployment rate stands at 4%, but in the diaspora, 11.4% of women are unemployed. An unequal gender balance in leadership and participation in CSOs led to 18% of respondents saying they would not consider a role in a North Korea-focused CSO, citing perceptions of women being downgraded to part-time, low-paid, or unpaid voluntary positions. However, 70% of respondents stated they would consider a role if there are more, more leaders in these organizations um, were exiled women. We also noted how this intersects with the financial precarity of many women in the diaspora. Although exiled North Koreans who have settled in South Korea are eligible for livelihood benefit, 50% of respondents lived in households whose monthly gross income was less than 1 million South Korean won, uh, which equates to around um, 865 US dollars. The effect of trauma amongst exiled women constituted another persistent but little discussed barriers to entry into CSOs. Our study revealed that 63% of respondents found um, talking or reading about North Korean human rights issues to be traumatic, and that 45% of respondents who had experienced human rights violations in North Korea were aware of the harm. These findings are supported by the Korea HANA Foundation, who in 2016 published a report that found 51% um, of unemployed exiled women over the age of 30 had been discouraged from seeking employment due to health conditions, and 62% over the age of 40 had resigned for the same reason. Finally, we observed that many women in the diaspora perceived that they were lacking in professional training and experience, and therefore were not suitable for roles that men had traditionally dominated. While this type of situation is not specific to the field of human rights, it is worth noting that there are no required qualifications or professional um, experience for becoming a human rights advocate or leader. Yet there was a common belief uh, that women's work history and levels of education should match those of men in the field, um, in, and in this, the expectations women ha had um, were gender biased and reflective of the education and experiences of men. The reality is that exiled women do possess standards of education that would enable them to apply for many roles in CSOs. Over 40% of respondents had completed their studies at high schools in South Korea and 36% of South, um, at South Korean universities. Almost every respondent had direct lived experience of human rights violations in North Korea and the majority escaped North Korea due to infringement of their fundamental human rights. Although 72% had not received an education in human rights in North Korea and 55% received irregular or no education in human rights since their arrival in South Korea, 70% understood the concept of human rights and accessed information on human rights through online news platforms and social media. Over 50% frequently discussed um, human rights issues in North Korea with their Excel friends, 17% with family members, and 17% with South Korean friends, and 35% even aimed to establish their own human rights organizations. So rather than an unequal or inadequate education, it is a lack of experience and involvement that can prevent exiled women from making use of their knowledge in CSOs. An exiled human rights leaders recall that um, it took her a long time to become familiar with the notion of a leader when she had settled in South Korea, explaining that few exiled women would aspire to become a leader because of the effects of North Korea's strong patriarchal system that excludes women from many areas in the workplace and public life. Um, from our findings, we can see that there are many gender-driven obstacles that women must navigate. 
Exiled women face social discrimination, high levels of unemployment, mental health issues, glass ceilings, and entrenched social norms that pressure women to sacrifice their careers and financial autonomy. These factors combine to create overlapping and complex barriers that disadvantage exiled women and preclude their employment in many sectors, including civil society. Nonetheless, we found that many exiled women um, would consider a role in CSO focused on North Korea if the barriers identified in this report were dismantled and more women assumed leadership roles. This is not a radical proposition. However, it does require a conversation that prioritizes the voices of exiled women and creates buy-in from CSOs, grant makers, and philanthropic entities. In our report, we offer some recommendations that are mindful of the fact that some of the more structural issues, such as identity-based and gender-based discriminations, are going to be long-term challenges that require a far greater range of voices and action than civil society. We recommend that exiled women seek local allies and CSOs focus on North Korea, but that um, they also broaden their per, um, personal networks out of the North Korean human rights ecosystem to engage national organizations in South Korea that do not currently work in the North Korean human rights field, in addition to supporters in the global women's rights movement. Uh, we recommend that exiled women build collective action with other exiled women and men in the diaspora to ensure their underrepresentation does not remain a marginal issue. And we suggest they innovate and be open to new ways of conceiving human rights work and participation within CSOs by exploring new technologies and new organizational and leadership structure. Fundamentally, we believe that exiled women have the ability to reimagine how human rights work can function for them, given that the field as it exists today was largely built without their inclusion and voices. For CSOs, we recommend that we all support one another and look at ourselves to ask if our workplace practices can become more inclusive of the lived realities of exiled women in the diaspora, including accommodating caregiving responsibilities and childcare. We know that our workplaces and how we work um, present barriers, so we must ask ourselves um, what we can do to address this. Um, it is clear that we must introduce new systems of recruitment and training that can reach and support exiled women who may apply for roles in our workplaces. Outreach here is critical, but so is speaking to younger generations of exiles um, and creating opportunities for them to learn from us and us to learn from them. And given the disparity in leadership, we should also ask a more challenging question concerning incumbency, which can prevent women from assuming leadership roles in many different sectors. We should consider how leadership transitions or new approaches to organizational hierarchies can increase the effectiveness of a CSO and not prevent women from leadership. Finally, we see the roles of funders and donors as critical in stirring how CSOs function and how gender equality can be promoted across the field. We suggest that funders consider supporting organizations they fund to implement mentorship and training for young exiled women who are currently in special schools, universities, and other social organizations to facilitate their entry into CSOs focused on human rights but also to learn how they perceive the field and how it can better reflect their experiences. We also note how current funding structures were seen by exiled women as presenting a high risk based on their short-term nature and that this created a disincentive for women who were already facing financial precarity. A more sustained and long-term funding model for women-led or women-dominated CSOs may increase financial security and less in the financial barriers that disproportionately impact exiled women. Um, at an organizational level, we would support and encourage funders of CSOs to speak to their organizations about incorporating gender positive practices, such as conducting gender audits, thinking about how gender responsive working structures can increase representation, and how gender fair recruitment practice can be implemented into organizational culture and policies. To provide a concrete example, 
we found that childcare responsibilities for exiled women created far higher barriers to entry into civil society than those facing exiled men or South Korean women, but that many of these exiled women would actively seek employment in human rights organizations if solutions could be found to their childcare. So ultimately, we can't talk about gender equality if we are not talking about child care. In many industries, we see that large organizations are supporting nursery spaces for parents with children, especially women, to enable them to re-enter the workforce. And in smaller organizations, we see some organizations creating a child care line in every budget to again support parents, and again, especially women, to re-enter the workforce. Um, this is something that we could see funders of human rights organizations lead on and either encourage or possibly mandate the organizations they fund to allocate a percentage of their budgets for women or men with children. For example, um, this example, uh, which would be relatively quick and simple to implement, uh, would itself begin to resolve just one of the issues we documented and bring more talent and gender balance to the field. Finally, in some cases, funders can set the framework within which CSOs submit project proposal for funding. Um, where this happens, we would encourage funders to ask CSOs to examine the role of gender and the experiences of North Korean women in funded research and advocacy on human rights in North Korea as a core component of our projects. Thank you. Back to you, Suyan. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, if you, for those who like to ask questions, please submit it through the Q&A feature on the bottom. Um, so now we'll move on to the next question. Um, so the next question is for Kyungmin. Uh, our audience is wondering what international civil society, particularly women's human rights groups, uh, can do to support North Korean women. And um, there are further follow-up questions and let me read it through for you. Are there any coalitions or platforms for engagement where we can help? Is their language going to be a barrier? How can information be disseminated to these groups and how can we hear back? So, um, thanks for your questions. Um, first, um, that this is um, something we highlight, highlighted in our report. Uh, we believe that women coming together from different regions and fields alongside um, exiled North Korean women um, is incredibly important. In fact, we think that North Korean women being given space to come together themselves is also just as important. Um, more broadly, I think the North Korean human rights field can benefit from learning and speaking with a wide pool of advocates. Uh, and for North Korean women, um, this is perhaps even more important. Uh, we can see in other regions why, um, you know, how groups can uh, groups run by women have made big strides, and where gender equality can uh, has clear re results. Our field isn't quite there yet, um, so alliances and solidarities um, will be important to our development. I also think that um, the this is a broader point. Um, we should be looking outwards as a field and learning where we can. Um, to answer the last point, there is no one certain um, central platform, but if there um, is interest from global women's rights advocates, we would be happy to facilitate space for conversations and with exiled women who we work with. Um, please send us an email um, through our website and we can arrange a time to speak. Thank you for the answer. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, and this question is also for Kelman. The question says, um, as a role of funders seems critical in addressing some of the issues you've raised, uh, are they the key to unlocking gender equality in the workplace and then the results that come from that in the work of organizations? Thank you again for the question. Um, the role of funders is certainly very important, but this has to be a collective effort among civil society, funders, the diaspora, and the beneficiaries of the work of civil society. 
Um, for example, we recognized some time ago that we needed to commit um, to a more equal workplace and we have conducted a gender audit in the past, um, undertaken training in things like um, unconscious bias and are open as a team about this and other related issues. There is of course always more to do and it's something we are happy to discuss. More broadly, we have seen that some funders do require their grantees to address um, gender balances as a condition of funding. And I think that is um, to be supported. We would advocate for that message to last throughout a funding life cycle and for it to cross over from staffing into work products, communication and all other areas of work. Um, but if we are um, looking at a short their term fix, then positive action from funders is always going to be a viable option for CSOs. The key will be to make sure this is a lasting change in organizational culture and to ensure that everyone understands why this is important rather than it being imposed without dialogue and openness. Within our field, we don't see there um, being any immovable barriers. Um, instead, we see lots of solutions and opportunities for positive change and dialogue. Thank you so much for the question and answer. I think uh, that's all we have time for today. So thank you everyone for joining us. And if you have any further questions, feel free to contact myself or Kyung Min. Our emails will be in the chat room. I will post it right away here. And you can also contact us through our website. Thank you so much for your participation.